Hello, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my very good old friend and absolutely amazing, wonderful cellist and musician, uh, David Waterman. Um, this is now a new Beethoven series, so thank you very much uh, for joining us. And David, you know, as you have guessed, the, the topic is all about Beethoven, and this is at least what we can do. You know, such an um, important year for Beethoven, uh, you know, 250 and not a very lucky year, I guess, so to, to celebrate his uh, anniversary. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for having me, Yulia. It's such a pleasure to talk to you and see you again. Yeah. And um, yes, I suppose you're right. It is unlucky. Maybe, this, maybe it makes us reflect on Beethoven's isolation and his deafness, which was, uh, I mean, he was such a warm and gregarious man. And, and the deafness not, not only was, uh, you know, obviously, uh, a huge problem in terms of being a musician but but in terms of being a social being he was forced into isolation so maybe we get some idea of what it was like for him except that he was doing it of suffering it alone instead of sharing it with the internet as we are yeah that that is extraordinary i actually i must say i I've never thought about it, and I, you are absolutely right. You know, the, 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 this sort of isolation, of course, you know, that mm. you have when you can't hear. He um, writes about it, actually. I mean, he, he actually he talks about it. Um, it partly came from an embarrassment because he felt that his career as a musician would be hampered if people realized he was deaf. So he, he deliberately tried to hide it for a long time, yes. <clears throat> especially at the beginning. And, um, but partly, you know, just the sheer frustration of not being able to hear what people were yeah. saying to him, even when it was known that he was deaf. And then the conversation, the, the, the notebooks started the conversation books, but it's very different um, writing yes. things down. <laughs> of, of course, and, and it must be, I guess, um, I mean, difficult but also I think you you kind of blame yourself there is a sort of that guilt and I think anger right within you I think that's that's what um, a lot sits in the in the music you know that subconscious kind of dissatisfaction with yourself I, I mean at least that that's what I'm thinking I don't know if I hear that um, I mean I hear sometimes rage and anger mm. sometimes but I but on the other hand I think that's of a small part of it. I mean, there's such a range of yeah, sure. emotions. I mean, there's there's everything, isn't there? I mean, there's exactly there's such humour. There's such lightheartedness. There's sure. such joy. I mean, he, he's one of the composers who sounds joyful and utterly yeah. untrammeled joy, That's almost true. as much as anybody. And there's there's lovingness. There's moral seriousness. There's um, you know energy. Um, serenity everything really i mean I, I just sort of pick this up because you quite often hear beethoven characterized as a, as a <clears throat> you know, fist shaking angry composer because of one or two works because of yeah, yeah, maybe sure. the fifth symphony or parts of the fifth symphony and then some obvious works um but i think there's so much that i think that's that's not a major part of right. what he does it's only looking at the quartets yeah you know, you could say almost every other one is a very gentle and, and, and warm and, and funny uh, uh, piece. As my, I mean, 59.2 is, is extremely yeah. tense and intense and fist shaking, but 59.1 is pastoral, it's like a pastoral symphony, same key, and it's just f expansive and, and um, you know, largely speaking, extremely good natured, extremely playful. So it's it, it's all there, and and what there is in all of them is complete integrity and self confidence and self assuredness. Yeah. Um, yeah, so th that's what I hear. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that the kind of the range is touched. You know, it's it's. It's so wide. It really is, yeah. you know, just just like a I don't know barometer. It's the the arrow is here, and then the next. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. It's it's beautiful, and I think that's what makes it very hard 
to play at least um i think one of the most difficult things for me is this rapid uh dynamic changes you know mm. how do you adapt for that and i'm really wondering if we can go a little bit into sort of the technicality of of this yes. you know, yeah i think this would be very interesting for me to to explore yes yes indeed uh, absolutely also i mean i think hard to play in the late period uh the the rapid and extreme changes of mood are hard to capture as a player because as a player one is so identified with a particular mood and sure. it comes through you and you feel the mood and then and then suddenly to change your face and become a completely different character completely different mood is 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 emotionally challenging i think one has to get used to doing that and that's that's particularly a feature of the of the later Works, Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I think this is, for me, I mean, Beethoven is an extremely, you know, hard composer to interpret well, but I think also technically and in your brain, exactly what you say, it's so hard to switch when it's not your music, you almost have to sort of be in his shoes. And, and I'm, I'm really wondering, I, I know it's a very maybe personal, maybe too personal um, uh, question, but um, do, how do you prepare for this? Uh, do you have images that you try to change in your head or is, does it just come naturally because you practice and essentially you become that kind of piece of music? Yes, I think <laughs> this is a big question. I mean, I think I think in the end, you 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 do become that piece of music, and and all the other all the myriad of details of your practicing, um, both musical details and and instrumental details, um, hopefully are are so embedded and and and, and mastered in a way that you that in performance you are just embodying the piece the piece is living through the prism of you the way you see it which hopefully is different slightly different from the way anyone else sees it but it's a relationship between you and the score and um which creates a, a unique moment it's a relationship between you on that particular evening yes on the score which might be different from the following week um but i think more and more when i prepare any piece really is not specific to Beethoven at all, but um, I, I, I do want to know how it's built. I, I want to know, you know, I want to follow the motives and the melodies and see how they develop and see how they interact and do tend to think of them as characters in a novel in which they grow and interact and they have a story and I want to know what story the music is telling. And part of that story is the uh, not only the melody and the, the motif, but the harmonic structure yeah. in in almost any sonata form of music sure. um, or t tonal music rather, um, and understanding the the well the harmonic design of sure. of of the work and of each movement, because in the, the, I'm not so much talking about each change of chord on a very very local level, but more the the major changes of key. Sure. Because they so much paint a picture of the the mood, the, the sort of the underlying feeling. I mean a modulation, yes. a modulation to a, uh, from a major to a minor key, from a minor to a major or, 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 or certain relationship, key relationships have a certain feeling. I mean added to all the other aspects, rhythmic and, and motivic sure. and, and so on. But that's a very important. So I really feel I want to um, understand that very clearly and then I suppose I mean the phrase shapes the, the, the how, how long each phrase is where the music breathes the, um, the, sh the, the main point in every phrase I mean where, where the point of greatest tension is where the point of relaxation is because there's always in this music in all music I think um, intensification and relaxation is almost the fundamental That's thing right. that can happen rhythmically with syncopation and yeah. then returning to the beat and harmonically with dissonance and returning to yeah. consonance um motivically straying from the, the motive and returning to it and so on so it's a constant living breathing 
and I think one has to sense that in, in each piece. And so all those things go into the studying, but also I think just a lot of things, a lot is happening unconsciously. Yeah. If you're living with a piece, you're just singing it to yourself and imagining yeah. it to yourself, and humming it to yourself and yeah. dreaming it when you're, when you're asleep and so on. And, Very true. And, and at the deepest level, that's probably the most important thing that's happening. I mean, it's getting absorbed and you're just finding the most natural way, an organic way of thinking of every part of it and how it all fits together. So that in the end, you want both yourself and the audience to be completely unaware of all the detailed work that's gone mm -hmm. into it. I mean, one is not showing things, one is not um, giving an analysis of the piece while one's playing it or anything like that. It's just a natural utterance, just like singing in the shower. And um, it just comes out in the most natural way. And that, that's what one is aiming for. But I think the naturalness comes from hard work. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> I mean, I think for some people, they just are able to rely completely on their instincts. And if, mm -hmm. if they're extremely, extremely gifted, perhaps sometimes that's enough. Although I think usually it's not enough, even for the very gifted, because there are always going to be some styles and some issues which are not not so clear even to the most instinctive musician and I think one has to um, be able to understand on all levels but at the end it has to come back to the instinct the instinct having been steeped in your study and so it certainly must end up being instinctive but your instincts have maybe been molded or changed yes of course the process of your your study that's so valuable, David. Um, it really is because I think um, now there's very little um, kind of I don't know. People think that they can get away with very little knowledge of harmony or you know background, these kind of mm. things. But that is actually what makes the music. You know, that's essentially you know how your piece is developing, and and you can. Yes, you know. I, I think one problem is that in a lot of uh, music colleges and schools the study of analysis and harmony and uh, and so on is so separated from yeah. playing so you go to your teacher with your instrument and, and have an hour's lesson um, and then you maybe go to your history lesson or your analysis lesson sitting behind a desk with a pen and piece of paper and and they're, com they're completely unrelated so I mean, I, I find that I sometimes coach students who actually have far more theoretical knowledge than I do, um, which is not difficult. And uh, but they but they're not applying the simplest of things into their playing. So they play, you know, in in they play a phrase which has a an intense, I don't know, diminished harmony. Yeah. It goes the way through, and then it resolves and relaxes on, onto the cadence which they would know perfectly well in the schoolroom, as it were, by their desk, mm. but by the way they're vibrating on the instrument and, 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 and using the bow, they're not doing that simple and obvious relaxation. And somehow my feeling is that one should study harmony and analysis with the instrument in your hand. Yeah. Yeah. That it should be completely organically connected. And integrated, yes. Yeah, integrated, yes. exactly. Yes. That's yes. a good word, made whole. And um, so it shouldn't be seen as some sort of dry, academic, irrelevant process where one can fall asleep and skip and sort of text under the desk because it's only analysis. It is part and parcel of, part and parcel of feeling the piece. And, and I mean, this expression about understanding music in the case of music mm -hmm. is a feeling process. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't understand music in some analytic yes. written way if you don't feel what you're talking about yeah. then you don't understand it sure. and I mean audiences can sometimes understand music much better than players in the sense that they really if they're very musical you know someone in the audience can really feel what's going on even yes. if they can't name it yes or, uh, so on. and that's that's a much better form of understanding than being able to name it but not feeling it and um, an analysis, but it is not just a matter of naming. I mean, for instance, isn't perhaps not so important to be able to name each chord, but I think it is important to recognize that a certain key 
which is a uh, um, like the grit in the oyster in the oyster in a certain piece keeps returning but there might be five minutes or ten minutes sure. between each return and because we tend not to have a, a memory for that key having been through other keys it's easy to miss that but that might be a very important start sure. part of the story and if the player understands it then they can help to play it in such a way which mm-hmm. makes it um this makes it happen in a certain way in them and then the audience might respond even if yeah. unconsciously sure. yeah. there's a good example in in the, the e minor 50 59 to quartet uh, in which really the note c um the flattened six comes in all the first three movements sort of fortissimo and really strongly emphasized and there's no doubt that it's an important moment because and there's a big clash between c and b the dominant b and the c there's a huge clash between them before it resolves onto e and that happens in every single one of the three movements and that is not an accident and then it's not an accident in the fourth movement the whole movement starts in c major even though we're in E minor, but the whole melody is C major. And then it's yanked back to E minor and that keeps happening. That's, a, that's the sort of essence of the, of the main theme in the, in the last movement. Now, I mean, that sort of thing, it, 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 it is really important to be aware of that sort yes. of thing, I think. Otherwise you're, you're missing what's going on in the piece and the way the movements relate to each other. So, so, David, I mean, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, um, quartets, of course, because, you know, yeah. you are part of a very famous um, quartet, Indelian Quartet, and you have, I mean, really, your concerts are just a joy. And I really, you know, one of the few quartets where I feel is just one sort of live, one creature that you you really are so connected. And um, I'm, I'm wondering... Um, so do you, I mean, I'm sure this question was asked a lot and it's a bit boring, but do you ever have a disagreement now in, in these years? Or, you know, because, you know, there are four human beings, they, they might yeah. think differently, or do you really have one sort of thought behind all four of you? Not at all. We disagree all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and very radically um, about, about so much. I mean, I think... Um, I mean, actually, to, just to pick up on what you were saying about feeling that the quartet is, is one instrument. I mean, in many ways, I think whether you should sound like one instrument depends on the writing of, of what, what you're playing. And, and very often, actually, you should sound like very distinct voices because the typical quartet texture is... Um, two or three voices, I mean, there'll be a main voice, but there'll also be a, subsid- a subsidiary voice and the bass line is sort of a voice. Um, so at least two or three voices. And the voices keep changing. So who has the main line keeps changing, who has the subsidiary voice keeps changing, even who has the bass line changes. Yeah. I, I, I guess um, what I meant that, uh, you know, um, of course I understand about the voicing, but you, uh, you know, when you perform, I always feel that you know, you are um, really behind that idea, especially as if you are one brain. Of course, I yeah, yeah, that's yeah, brain, what I yeah, think I, see, I understand yes. exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's. I mean, it's great if it sounds like that, but no, we we do, <laughs> we do have a lot of disagreement uh, about what we're doing. But I suppose, you know, we over the years we've tried a lot of. Th- I mean, we try and. It's or try out anybody's suggestion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so important to do that because so often, I mean, I coach young quartets and so often I think they're arguing about words. I don't really know what it is they're differing about sometimes, except that they prefer one, one of them is fixated on one particular word for describing it and someone else doesn't really like that word. Uh, I mean, that's not the only problem, but, but when they actually, actually pick their instruments and play it, and they try someone's idea. The the person whose idea is being tried often says, "Oh, well, I didn't really mean that. Uh, I mean that, but we've got to do this as well to make it work. And maybe I mean a bit less of that. And I don't mean, you know. And and it's modified a lot. You have you have to have about five goes at trying it until you're trying it to the satisfaction of the person making the 
suggestion. And then sometimes the person who's opposing the idea might say, oh yes, well, I, I like most of that, but, but I just think we need to add it. We mustn't lose sight of this as well. And we say, okay, let's add that. And you add that and, you know, in a, in a good rehearsal, everybody in the end says, yes, that's what I meant. And, and uh, you've modified all the ideas a little bit and you, you've been by, by the trying and they, they modify trying. Um, of course, it doesn't always happen like that. I mean, sometimes you just simply do not find a way. And I think over the years, we, we learned not to push and push and push to a resolution. I mean, to sleep on it and wait till the next time we rehearse. And maybe someone comes up with a third idea, which is neither of the two competing ideas. And there are always a hundred ways of doing things and one shouldn't get too fixated on the, the opposing ideas because there are many more. And, and so, um, I mean, for instance, tempo, is, is, a, is one of the hardest things to fix because if someone just feels that it's way too slow or way too fast and, and you try it in the slow way and the, the other person says, no, it's too slow and you go to the fast way and the other person says, no. And, and if you just go backwards and forwards like a pendulum, that's not going to take get you anywhere. Sure. Um, so I, I think that the solution is um, the f to, to realise that the feeling of a tempo is 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 so um, affected by so many other factors rather than the metronomic speed, sure. and there are lots of things work well if everything is in place at different metronomic speeds. So so it might be that what's troubling the person who thinks it's too fast is that it's a bit breathless. Yes. There's not enough uh, space between phrases. It's too cluttered. The balance needs to be clarified more clearly. Um, there needs to be room for a certain amount of rubato. So it's a basic tempo, but it needs rubato here and there. Uh, all, all these things. And if you introduce these elements, then it maybe stops feeling quite so too fast. And then if you go to the slow version, and the, the, the person who wants it faster thinks, well, it's just dragging and it's, uh, well, okay, so you take out too many beats for them. Oh. You make, you make it, even though it's slow, you make it in two four or in four four or whatever, and and you you um, you don't actually make rips at the end of the phrases, and 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 and, and you you keep the, the the shape of the phrase in mind despite the slow tempo. Then that improves as well. And then at some point you, you can just play roughly in the middle, and you've sorted out all those other factors, and, and everything falls in place. And again, everyone says that's the tempo I, I thought. <laughs> And, and it might well not be the tempo yeah. actually that you thought, but you're happy with it. Fantastic. So, I mean, these yeah. are the processes of rehearsing which are benign and, mm. and very satisfying. Yeah. And when it goes wrong, it's when people get very dug into what they yes. believe. In sure, the sure, battle. sure. And, and it's, and, um, or you just don't have the creativity that data find all these surrounding features which make a big difference and another day you will and I suppose it's very important not to get too embattled into your position because uh, that will make it less likely that the next day when new ideas come in that you'll be open to them. David, it's really interesting, actually, really, um, for all, I guess, you know, chamber ensembles, you know, even yeah. like a duo, it's, it's so important. But let's come back to, um, uh, you know, Beethoven's um, late uh, quartets. I mean, mm one of the really best really music ever written um but it's it's a it's huge it's marathon i mean i um, you know i'm a pianist i um i only kind of hear it um you know i don't play it so but i always some, um, find that um i need kind of space you know even after a, a one quartet to digest so how does it feel to perform it and because it's usually done as a cycle and do you agree do you agree that the, the kind of to play it as a cycle is the way to to play it? Though that that interests me a lot. Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, I think the, the vast vast majority of times we've performed Beethoven quartets has just been as one piece in a concert of other okay. composers. Mm -hmm. We okay. we've played the cycle. I mean, sort of in the vast majority of our quartet concerts, we've included a Beethoven piece right. of one sort or another. Um, I would say you know, much more than 50% of the time. Um, but we've done probably only about 15 or 16 cycles mm -hmm. in our time um, 
fact, we have an interrupted one at the moment in, in Cambridge, which, which we never finished, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but um, um, it's very different playing them as a cycle. I mean, it's, each piece is, is a unique universe. Yeah. I mean, we talked about all the different emotions and the, the different characters in, in Beethoven's works within work and from one work to another. Um, but there's also you know, completely different techniques, completely different sound world. I mean, I'm not sure if somehow you'd, you'd, you'd become uh, an aficionado of classical music, but somehow you'd never heard a work of Beethoven. And, and if I played you an Opus 18 and then played you Opus 135, I mean, would you know it was the same composer? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if if I did that with Bach or with Mozart, you would certainly know. Yes. There's no question you would know. But with, with Beethoven, I'm not sure. It's so different. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you are familiar with it, it feels that despite all the huge differences, every work is saturated with Beethoven. So in a way, I'm contradicting myself. But, mm -hmm. but, but I think, you know, once you know Beethoven, it's just purely him, whether it's Opus 18 or whether it's 132. Um, but even within the lates, it's like each piece is a universe. I mean, he gets an idea which for, for other composers would be a complete compositional style for a lifetime, which for Beethoven he uses in one movement only <laughs> and, and, and never again. Um, completely extraordinary. And, and every, I think they're very, three or four of the, the lates are very related to each other motivically and in all sorts of ways. And yet there's such a different feel. Um, to them. Sorry, I've completely forgotten. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's exactly, you're exactly right. It's about, you know, playing. So playing as a cycle. Know, yes, as a cycle. Yeah. And um, so, really, because it's a like a marathon, really. For, for, it, is know, a bit, yeah. it is a bit of a feeling like that. But I think, I mean, the, 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 the benefit of the cycle is, you know, it puts each of the works in the perspective of the other, of the other pieces. I mean, you, you feel how different they are and you feel how Beethoven they all are. Yes. I mean, you get both those sort of feelings and, although, and, and you marvel at how different they are and yet they're coming from one incredibly expansive heart and brain. And, um, and the, I, I mean, the cycle is wonderful for showing that. And it is, it is for the player an absolute mountain to climb. Um, yeah. but, but there is something absolutely exhilarating and thrilling when you when you get we we all always ended with opus 130 in the grace of fugue yeah. and uh, the fugue in itself is a <laughs> i mean opus 130 is a mountain to climb and then when you get to the end of it the fugue is an enormous mountain to climb and uh, there was always something absolutely thrilling thrilling about bringing a cycle to an end this sort of huge journey which you've gone through with your audience and bring it to an end with such an extraordinary, um, uh, an engrossing piece as the Grace of Fugue. Mm. Oh, well, it's it's really fascinating, and of course. Um... I mean, as I said, I am um, keep coming back to this idea that, you know, you do it as one brain, but you're four people there. So that's, I, I, I really uh, find that extraordinary as, as, a, as a pianist, you know, yeah. that, 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 that it's, um, and I know how, how um, difficult it is to get to that, you know, stage and um, how, how much work um, goes yeah. into it. But um, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I always was under impression that in Beethoven times, there wasn't really something like a fixed quartet. Um, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I, I couldn't find somewhere you know yeah. that people were fixed so do you think it kind of affected the, the, the way they played it at the time it must have done i mean you're absolutely right that there, there, there weren't really any professional quartets in the sense of people spending the majority of their time uh making their living playing in a string quartet really until between until after the first world war yeah. mm -hmm. Um, there were there were some quartets, but I think the, the players were only very occasionally spending their time playing them. So in Beethoven's time, there, there was um, there was a quartet called the Schupanzi Quartet, mm -hmm. and and they they played to Beethoven, and Beethoven knew them and knew them each individually as well, and they would get together and play a new Beethoven quartet to him, 
and he would coach them on it. And they would maybe play it in a performance or two. But they certainly weren't traveling around Europe being the Chupanzi Quartet. They were, <laughs> they were, they were doing, <laughs> mostly doing other things. And, um, and of course, the famous Joachim Quartet, which had, you know, in a way, relatively fixed members when they were in Berlin or nearby. But when Joachim came to England to play a quartet tour, he didn't bring yeah. the members of the Joachim Quartet with him. He played with three British players. I think the idea for quartets was that they were for the players. The, 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 they, were, they were played mm -hmm. um, for the pleasure of playing together uh, rather than perform. They weren't exactly seen as concert uh, vehicles in the way that symphonies were. Um, and I, I, I have very little idea how much people practiced and rehearsed them yeah. Um, I mean, you could not play a Rasmowski Quartet Relay Quartet without rehearsing it, that's for sure. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, helpful to have Beethoven coaching you on it, no doubt. Yeah. Although although he was pretty deaf by the time he was writing, especially the late Quartet. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> but yes, it must, it must have been very different. But on the other hand, it must have been thrilling. I mean, and there is a wonderful story of, of, of a... Um, quartet playing Mozart's first six quartets dedicated to Haydn and, and Mozart was playing and Haydn was playing and Distersdorf was playing. Um, and, uh, you know, two or three people listening like Mozart's father. Yeah. And that's for the first time that the, 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 the Mozart were, which were dedicated to Haydn, yeah. were, were played. And these yeah. evenings must have been incredible. But um, very different from hearing a professional quartet play play them for the for the three hundredth time in in, in the Wigmore, <laughs> for instance. Um, but um, um, there's no doubt that that uh, that Haydn Mozart Beethoven took quartet writing extremely seriously. I mean, just the fact that Beethoven devoted his last years to writing almost nothing but quartets sure. um, and just from the nature of the works I mean one only has to listen to them know, to know that they were yeah. taken vastly seriously so maybe it was it was probably an advantage in many ways that they weren't meant for large audiences yes because Beethoven I mean he, he the last quartets I mean he's deaf and he's isolated and he's ill and and he was just writing them because he needed to write them. So there are no restraints. There's no constraints of what is technically possible, what will be understandable to the audience. What you know, All these things have gone. It's just completely him expressing himself. And when people complain they couldn't understand them, he said, well, they're, they're written for a later age. But actually, they're written for himself. Yeah. And he, he I suppose he knew if they were as coherent and as wonderful as I'm sure he knew they were, that people would one day appreciate them. But it really wasn't his business. He wasn't going to know. He wasn't going to know about that. They just had to be written because they were there in his heart. And um, and I, mean, I guess that's how it was. Has it has, you yeah. said a bit earlier about, and it just comes back to me uh, uh, about from the point of view of a pianist imagining um, sort of uh, studying and playing these quartets with four different brains as opposed to one different brain. It's quite an interesting comparison because, because so often in the writing there are three or four different voices and more and more towards the late period which becomes more and more mm -hmm. contrapuntal in texture. Um, I would say the quartet, I mean, from a pianist's point of view, playing a late Beethoven piano sonata, you have to be able to divide yourself into three yes. or four independent yes. entities. Yes. So, so, I mean, not only are you playing all these different lines, but the phrasing and shaping and even the character sure. of a bass line might be completely different. Yeah, from yeah. yeah. And different, again, from the soprano voice. Mm -hmm. So that you somehow, I don't know how you do it, you have three or four people phrasing to different places and playing with different characters and different voices. Well, for the string quartet, that's easy. 
Yes. Because we are four different people and we can, we can engross ourselves mm. in the one line that we're playing. But what's difficult for us and easier for you is, is to have a unified overall conception. Yes. Which yes. you can have your arguments within yourself. But, 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 but basically easier to resolve those and you are one organizing musical, musical brain playing, whereas the quartet has to, has to work at that. So, that, so we have piano and string quartet. We have exactly opposite That's exactly advantages and disadvantages in playing what is quite similar music. I mean, Beethoven himself arranged one of the piano sonatas, uh, Opus fourteen, number one, a wonderful arrangement for string yes. quartet, in which he really thought about it and mm. said, and he said, no one else could have done this. He even changed the key, um, and he, he he composed a lot very differently. And it's a fascinating study to compare the two. Yeah. Yeah. But but really, I hear all the piano sonatas could be arranged theoretically yeah. for string quartet. I mean, they have the same sort of voices and voice leading and so on. And and um, and similarly, you could be playing the quartets on the piano theoretically, although you couldn't probably manage all the notes. And um, it's very similar music. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, I would love to have um, sort of chamber partners to, to help. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> would be terrific. Um, yeah. um, so, um, David, really one of the last kind of few questions. Um, has your perception of Beethoven's music changed over the years? Um, actually, I don't think it's radically changed. But I think it's, I don't know, it's deepened. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my emotional response is stronger and stronger to the music the older I get. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I hear the pieces. I suppose the perception has been broadened by knowing more and more Beethoven. I mean, by, I suppose when I started playing them, I didn't know all the piano sonatas. Yeah. I didn't know the Mrs. and the Mrs. I didn't know. I mean, it's, it's important to know yeah. everything that he wrote, or as much as you can as he wrote, because everything sheds light on everything else, um, either by contrast or similarity or, sure. or whatever. Sure. And I just think I, I love it more and more. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, that's, that's the main change. I think my fundamental idea of, of what it's about hasn't hugely changed. There might be specific movements. Yeah which I have a pretty different idea of. Mm -hmm. um, but broadly speaking, probably not. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And um, a last question for you. And um, I know it will be very hard, but um, just and it also sounds simple, but I, I don't want to kind of to, to, to be to sound simple. But what is really Beethoven's music for you? I mean, what are the kind of immediate adjectives that come into your head when when someone says Beethoven? They can be multiple. It's, it's just really interesting. Yeah. Oh, where do we start? Um, profound humanity warmth so in its total integrity moral seriousness and as soon as I say seriousness I want to say a, a huge amount of humor fun playfulness naughtiness <laughs> um, energy serenity it's the whole gamut yeah, I mean yeah. you can't limit it in any way yeah, it's yeah. really Everything is in Beethoven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I suppose that um, nothing is pale. I mean, it's, it's yeah. committed. Every every character is so... I mean, it might be ambiguous. There might be, or there might be two or three characters oh. going at the same time. There might be like characters on the stage in an opera. I mean, as in, mm. you know, as in Fidelia. Um, but... Um, but the sense of you know, utter commitment, yeah. and nothing, nothing pale, strong characters, um, even if they're very gentle characters. I mean, they can be yeah. really gentle characters yeah, and sure. very loving, but there's somehow there's a, there's a strength of feeling which is unmistakable. Yeah. And yet he's never sentimental. 
it's never self-pitying it's there's a there's a however hugely emotional it is there's a there's ultimately a balance and the structure and the healthiness about it about it all which is why he just about stays within the bounds of yeah. what one would call classical yeah. classical sensibility Oh, David, well, th that was really wonderful. And thank you so much for describing kind of the range that at least close to you, because I'm sure many, many feel the same, but it's so interesting to, to find out. Um, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much for being my guest. A really um, sheer delight. Thank you. Thank it's you. been a big pleasure for me as well. Lovely thank to you. see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.